Awesome. So before I introduce our very special guest today, I want to acknowledge all of you who have decided to spend your time right now to gather here in this virtual convening. Uh, we have people representing every region of the U.S., uh, just about every generation represented. Uh, we have a lot of diversity here, a lot of beautiful faces in one giant video chat. And uh, I want to thank you all for your presence and for your being fully present during this special hour. Uh, I also want to acknowledge that this is uh, obviously uh, a really strange time. Uh, can you please mute? Thank you. Um, it's a challenging time. It's a testing time. It's a, it's a time where I know a lot of us are feeling a lot during this time of social distancing. No. No. Um, do the headset. Sorry. Is that Jeffrey? I try not to do it by this. I'll mute you, Jeffrey. Um, I know a lot of us are, are hurting, right? And uh, we have to acknowledge that and, and do a lot more than just that. Um, and on the other hand, I also want to acknowledge that this, this is a, a unique time that presents many new opportunities, uh, opportunities for us to think about the state of our leadership today, to think about the relationship we have to those leaders, to think about the relationship we have to each other as citizens of the U.S. and uh, of the world, and to think about what democracy means to us, and to think about what technology can, how technology can better us and help us solve problems, not just feed us misinformation and uh, tear us apart. Um, I promise that you'll learn a lot today and that you'll meet at least a few cool people today as we'll do, we'll do uh, breakout groups in about 25 minutes. Um, also, we'll have a Q&A near the end, so hold your questions until then. I'll post a link later for you to submit your questions. And uh, just one more thing, please stay muted. Uh, and if anything resonates with you, please feel free to do uh, something I stole from a, a, another Zoom call last week, uh, a little spirit finger shake. So um, if, if, anything, if anything that Audrey says or anyone else says uh, really speaks to you, uh, this is how you're going to show it. Um, you can also feel free to, to use the chat as well. Um, so with that, I could not be more excited for this timely conversation with uh, Audrey Tang. Um, she is the Digital Minister of Taiwan, a democracy that has managed to keep its citizens protected from the outbreak with only a little over 100 cases. Um, she is a champion of open source software, a civic hacker, a humanist, an advisor to so many world leaders, including U.S. Congress people. Um, she is a revolutionary in many ways. Uh, and she's a philosopher, a writer, a poet, a speaker, and, a, and someone I could not be happier to have joined the Civics Unplugged community today. And I hope that she stays in our community for a while. So uh, please uh, welcome Audrey Tang for this Unplugged conversation. The, um, hello, world. Um, this is indeed a little bit early for me. This is 5 a.m. So Good morning. Uh, Good morning, the local time. Good morning. Um, and I may not be entirely coherent, uh, but it's fine. So um, let's get started. Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, right. So uh, um, I have a couple uh, slides to, to show, uh, mostly because people are asking where, where I'm calling from. Uh, like people are reporting from all the different cities, and that's great. And I want to also share with you uh, where I'm calling from. So awesome. I'm from um, Taipei. Uh, and this is my office. And so um, you can maybe, can you see my screen share? Yep. Okay, right. So, so this is um, my uh, office for the past four years as the digital minister. Um, as the digital minister in charge of social innovation, my office is literally co-created uh, with hundreds of social innovators around Taiwan. Um, and people, this is an open office. Uh, we tore down the walls. It used to be Air Force HQ. Everybody can just walk in and have 40 minutes of my time. I'm there, for example, every Wednesday from 10 a.m. to the evening. And anybody who, who wants to talk about, I don't know, self-driving tricycles, how we can modify them to, to fit um, the local population's needs of shopping hands-free in the flower market or whatever is um, free to have 40 minutes of my time. Um, and the core thesis of uh, this open conversation is that um, what our President Dr. Tsai Ing-wen said four years ago when she was inaugurated for the, her first term, she's in her second term now, she said, 
before, we think of democracy as a showdown between opposing values. For example, you can easily imagine, uh, for example, the values around economic development on one side and uh, environmental sustainability on the other, or scientific technological innovation on one side and social justice on the other. And in traditional public administration theory, uh, the career public service will be the rope here uh, that keeps everybody still tied together, trying not to break down um, under all the tensions uh, and try to arbitrate between uh, opposing values. However, as she pointed out, conversation between diverse values is now the norm. With the advent of the great social invention hashtag, um, we don't really need representatives to organize ourselves with the right hashtag. For example, when we occupy the parliament in 2014, or um, climate strike, mm. or Me Too, or whatever. People can organize very easily uh, without a intermediary or a Hong Kong anti-e-lab. Um, everything without uh, the need of these uh, intermediary representatives. And that creates a problem for the government because we cannot set up one agency for each trending hashtag. Uh, and so instead, we simply ask a different set of questions. We ask, instead of, you know, who are the representatives, how to arbitrate, we ask, uh, to give, given the different positions, are there common values? And given common values, are there, after all, some common um, innovations that can deliver on those values? And this is called effective partnership. And so I'll just show you um, this one simple website. This is uh, my uh, conversation uh, very early on after mm, I became social David. minister uh, with David uh, speaking for Uber at the time. Uh, and my condition of speaking to any lobbyist and uh, indeed any visitor is that we have to publish the entire transcript uh, after 10 days of co-editing. And in case of David, um, it's uh, also on uh, YouTube on 360 record, so you can very easily put on VR glass and relive the conversation. But the point here <laughs> is that um, I, I have this very interesting note here, right? So uh, David concluded the conversation saying, okay, I can ask the local team to prepare material and send them over to you. I'm like, sure, just note everything you send my way will be made public because my condition entering the cabinet is that all the meetings that I hold is public. And you can very easily see that since I become digital minister, I talked to 5,000 people uh, in over 200,000 uh, sections of speeches in more than 1,000 meetings. And that e applies even for internal meetings. And the behavior of uh, lobbyists really change uh, under radical transparency. Uh, whereas before they would make arguments that appeal to the private interests of politicians and themselves, um, under radical transparency, they only make arguments based on common interests and global goals. So for example, David Plouffe would talk about climate change mitigation, uh, about uh, empowering the more vulnerable people in the margins of the cities. And, and things like that. And instead of making any um, anything that doesn't resonate uh, with other stakeholders. Um, and so we systemically um, promote such radical transparent ideas into what we call data collaboratives. And data collaboratives is really the key to build trust between the various sectors. And I will just show one simple example, and then maybe we, we can move on to the next section. And this is called a presidential hackathon. So every year we run this uh, hackathon. Now you may think of hackathon as some two-day event, three-day event, but be because this is presidential, it's three months uh, of uh, collaborative hacking, civic hacking, and every case proposed during the hackathon need to correspond to one or more of the sustainable development goals, the global goals. So for example, um, two years ago when we first started the presidential hackathon, there was a um, water pipe repair person uh, who listened to the water pipe leaks um, in the Jilong region uh, where they hail from. It used to take two months from a water pipe leak to be uh, discovered. So because they have a limited people patrolling the, the water pipes and their work is kind of boring. And so uh, they said, what if we can train a machine apprentice using uh, machine learning so that we can wake up and look at WhatsApp or in Taiwan it's called line, um, and it would tell us uh, what are the three most likely leaking points uh, near us. So we can spend our time figuring out the solution instead of uh, just doing trivial redundant work. Um, and the private sector and the academics are really interested in this idea. So they co-created such a solution that reduce it to two days um, and they get the trophy. So every year 
We give out five such trophies. There is no prize money associated with the presidential hackathon. Rather, this uh, is a very simple trophy that is a micro projector underneath. So if you turn the micro projector on, it shows the image of the president handing the trophy to you, promising that whatever you did in the past three months will become national policy in the next 12 months. So it's basically a self-describing, a very meta trophy. Uh, and uh, whatever people proposed in their data collaborative, it could be empowering people in remote islands, the local nurses, instead of sending all the sick people to the main Taiwan island through helicopters. It may be a platform uh, for them to video conference uh, with the main island specialized doctors and so on. Uh, but the point is that the government only supports but never controls uh, the data collaboratives. Another example may be people um, using their balconies and their schools, primary school teachers, reporting on the air quality like PM 2.5 using those less than uh, 100 US dollars air boxes so that you can very easily see in more than 2,000 um, points. Now it's growing to more than 10,000 now. Uh, what the real um, time pollution is uh, in Taiwan, the air quality. Uh, and because they, frankly speaking, have more than 10 times uh, the measuring devices compared to the environment minister, they are more legitimate than the environment minister. Now Taiwan, because we're the Asia's most free society, um, maybe New Zealand, uh, equivalent to New Zealand, uh, we cannot beat the citizen scientists, we must join them. Uh, and so through this kind of data collaboratives, they really did a uh, negotiation with the environment minister saying, okay, in, uh, we can allow you to use our data inspect our data on the distributed ledger, uh, calibrate our uh, devices and algorithms, but in return, we're asking you to fill in the gaps. And what are the gaps? These are the industrial parks, the industrial areas that are private property. And these um, high school teachers cannot really break and enter and <laughs> install their airbox there, but people may suspect these industrial parks from polluting um, the air. And so it turns out that the government owns the lamp uh, in the industrial parks. Uh, and so we commit then to install their design, the micro uh, sensors on the um, lamps and uh, join instead of controlling the data collaboratives. And that by itself uh, is open source and open hardware. And everybody around the world can just download it and run it on their local hardware, uh, on Arduino, on Raspberry Pi and so on. And this is by itself a education material for sustainable development. Now, uh, I will just introduce one uh, last concept and how, uh, how we can make sure that, for example, when we did this helicopter replacement of video conferencing for uh, treatment of people on the remote islands, how uh, come that we can promise, because it requires a law change, it was not legal for a nurse to make diagnostics and uh, treatments based on uh, doctor's advices from remote, right? So uh, every of these uh, cases, when we say, okay, we promise to deliver it um, in the next 12 months, based on either personnel requirements, uh, budget requirements, or even regulatory adjustment, legal adjustments and requirements, it really need to build a level of uh, legitimacy that is equivalent uh, to a presidential mandate, right? So we did it through this national participation platform called JOIN, that's G-O-V, that T-W, is a one-stop um, platform for people to uh, vote uh, on e-petitions. Uh, when they get 5,000 petitions signatures, we will uh, meet them and respond one by one to their concerns. Uh, it's also regulatory pre-announcement, participatory budgeting, and everything like that. So it has more than 10 million visitors uh, out of uh, 23 million people in Taiwan, lots of people. So whenever uh, we get the hundreds or so of cases, each corresponding to a SDG, so 169 of those, uh, we hand 99 tokens, 99 points to each of those visitors on the join platform and say, okay, you may now freely distribute those points as kind of voting tokens on any of the uh, ideas that you think is good. So maybe you look at or maybe you get mobilized into uh, voting for uh, using drones and computer vision to stop marine debris uh, at the sea instead of waiting for it to hit the bay. 
it sounds a good idea. Um, and so you may vote it for one vote, which would cost you one point. But if you like it so much, you want to vote two votes, it would cost, going to cost you four points in total. Three votes is nine, uh, four is 16. It's, it's quadratic. The idea is that the marginal return is the same as the marginal cost of each additional vote. So uh, with 99 points, you can only vote nine votes instead of 10 votes because that would cost 100. Okay. So after voting nine votes um, and costing 81, you still have 18 left and nobody wants to squander their points. So maybe they look around and see another mm. SDG and learn something about it. For example, this is water box, uh, which is the same thing as air box, but you put it in the waterways in the agri-lands so that if you de de detect uh, the pollution from upstream uh, and you can pinpoint it to a specific plant that is polluting the organic plant, uh, then the Ministry of uh, Economy can actually cut the water and electricity supply for those plants on the organic plant areas that are uh, polluting the water. That sounds like a good idea. So you have 18 points, you can vote for four votes, that's going to cost you 16, and you still have two points left. And nobody wants to squander these. <laughs> so you may uh, look at around and maybe see another thing. This is using publicly listed data for public Public companies to predict how likely it is to um, uh, engage in shell company and fraud uh, in the next uh, quarter, and it's actually quite precise. And maybe you uh, you think this was certainly more than one vote, so maybe you take some back uh, from this. Uh, nine votes, and you do a seven and seven, and things like that. And so, um, on average, people vote for four or five different projects, and uh, really gets into the nuance and synergy between those global goals. Uh, and at the end of the voting, where uh, we get the top twenty announced, instead of as previous voting systems, uh, which usually leave half of the people feel that they have lost. Um, in quadratic voting, most people see at least one of their projects supported. Um, one uh, in the top 20 who to receive the coaching uh, and everybody feel they have won. And so just a very simple change in voting system, change the legitimacy theory, changes how the different teams see themselves as synergy making instead of uh, purely competing against each other. And then when the final result comes in and the five people, teams actually deliver something, it makes it much easier for the legislator to point at the voting results and say, hey, we got to legislate it. And so that's how the telediagnostics law uh, were legislated. So that's a just a very simple um, beginning of describing uh, some of the work we did. And most of the winning teams uh, are what we call assistive intelligence plus collective intelligence. Because once you have voted for it in quadratic voting, if it asks you to do some crowdsourcing work, uh, for example, help identifying marine debris um, and things like that, you will probably um, be enlisted in it. Everybody have two minutes of kindness, right? Uh, and so that is how it's like the two wings uh, of a uh, plane or a bird. Um, one part is assistive intelligence to uh, reduce the burden of people doing chores, but the other part is collective intelligence to make sure that the AI is not biased when it comes to uh, taking the people's ideas and so on. And so uh, I will finally say that even though I'm hailing from the capital of Taiwan, from Taipei City, um, and meeting people there every Wednesday, uh, sometimes through teleconference, I'm touring around Taiwan every other Tuesday as well. And I deliberately go to the most uh, rural, the indigenous, the offshore islands, and meet people where they're already having their town halls. And the key here is that it's a connected room. For them, they're just showing uh, uh, through a town hall and because Taiwan has more than 20 national languages half of which are indigenous we also have uh, indigenous translators uh, that then connect through wall size projectors back to the social innovation lab in Taipei so it's only me who travels and the 12 ministries that have sent delegates to my office they send their section chiefs or higher into the social innovation lab in Taipei and view through this kind of video conference what local people has to say so the for the past, past three years, people are getting um, into the habit of just showing to those digitally amplified town halls. And instead of, you know, just getting a written response uh, from the Minister of Interior saying, oh, we have to consider this, but the Minister of Health and Welfare also need input and things like that. And it can wait for, you know, one month or two and everybody uh, forgot what the original problem was. Uh, here is all the 12 ministries in the same room. They can brainstorm very easily. They don't have to say, I'll have to copy the Ministry of Economy because the Ministry of Economy is sitting right there. Uh, and because these people 
are section chief level, they can very easily innovate uh, and they get credit because it's radically transparent if they uh, brainstorm something that's useful. And if they say something that upset the local people, uh, they're not at risk. I'm the only one at risk because you cannot punch people uh, over Zoom. <laughs> um, that's, the, that's how I, um, by absorbing the risk and spreading the credit, making sure that people can get to the same page that they can innovate from across different sectors. And finally, um, this is kind of my, my job description <laughs> of uh, enhancing reliable data, building effective partnerships, and build open innovation that doesn't leave uh, anyone behind. And so, as conclusion, uh, I'll read you my job description because uh, four years ago, when I first became digital minister, uh, it's the first position in Taiwan. This is the first time that Taiwan has a digital minister. And the HR people ask, uh, what, what are you going to work on? I'm like, uh, it's very simple. It's just 17, 18, 17, 17, and 17, 6 of SDGs. And SDGs was just not even one year old at the time. And they say, no, minister, nobody um, remember those, uh, memorize those numbers. Right? So I'm like, okay, I'll just translate it. Uh, into plain English. So this is uh, somewhat rendered into plain English version uh, of the SDGs. And it goes like this. When we see the Internet of Things, let's make it an Internet of Beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear that the singularity is near, let us always remember the plurality is here. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much. Um, so I just want to say, like, um, Taiwan is such a blueprint for democracy um, around the country and certainly in the United States. Um, and uh, it, it's clear that uh, almost everything that you have mentioned applies to any um, any population, uh, and 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 as you were mentioning, it's not like Taiwan just has only one language that is spoken or one cultural group. Uh, it is it's very diverse. So, um, you know, when you have a blueprint here and you have the architect, um, you, you can't help but but feel a little bit blessed. Um, so. I would love to move into some questions that we, we crowdsourced from the group, uh, if you don't mind. So cool. So you left your life as an entrepreneur in uh, Silicon Valley around 2014, returning back to your home country of Taiwan. Why did you return? Right. So um, I, I'm always based in Taiwan, though. I only visit Silicon Valley maybe mm. two or three times uh, a, a year. Uh, and this is because I really don't like very long meetings. And if you're in the same time zone, you cannot help to to avoid uh, the, the long meetings. So I'm always based in Taiwan, but I work with uh, Apple, for example, on, on Siri, on computational linguistics. Uh, but uh, I've never been to Cupertino, actually. Uh, and so this is um, not literally me flying back to Taiwan. This is more like I transitioned uh, from being working mostly in the private sector to mostly working in the social sector. Um, and uh, there's two reasons. Uh, one is that uh, I've been a social entrepreneur uh, all my life. Uh, and given the um, Taiwan's civic um, hacking space, uh, we finally see that there is a sustainable model for people contributing almost full time to the good of the society and can nevertheless keep themselves fed. And this is uh, because of um, great platforms such as Patreon, that I'm sure that you're all uh, familiar with, uh, and uh, the Taiwanese equivalent of Kickstarter, it's called ZegZeg, uh, and also Flying V, and so on, that enable people who, for example, occupy the parliament uh, to crowdfund um, New York Times uh, entire um, pages of uh, advertisements that shows uh, how the occupiers uh, think and work and things like that. And so uh, with these new ideas around collaborative and collective action, uh, I feel that I can devote all my time into the social sector, into the civic sector, uh, without worrying about private sector things. And, and that's the, the kind of material reason. Uh, and the um, uh, social reason uh, is simply that it, it's more fun. Uh, I joined uh, the GovZero community very early on, and GovZero, or G0V, um, is a very simple idea. The G0V community, uh, which has been around for, for a very long time now, um, for I think since 2012, 
um, is a simple idea that if you uh, take any website, any government services, anything really that you don't like, uh, and if you uh, just change it O to a zero, and I'll demonstrate it to you right now. So for example, um, there's a Gov0 um, project, or maybe we can just go to g0v.it. And it will show something that's, and this is the inaugural Gov0 project um, that shows the budget. national budget yep. and daily expenses. Uh, and there's a overview graph that you can drill down and have a real-time conversation around the budget. Uh, and the same, actually, because there's no trademark or whatever around of zero. So you can do exactly the same, but changing the TW to IT, and then you see the same thing for the Italian national budget. Uh, and so it, 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 the zero is... And you, is and you helped with the Italian one? Yeah, of course. Course, so, of course. So, so it's it's not um, right, and, and they have prettier colors. But in any case, so um, the the point is that Gavzira is more like a meme. Uh, so yeah. it shows that anything that you don't like about the government, uh, like the gov, that tw, if you don't like this website, you just change your O to a zero. Yep. And you get into the shadow government. <laughs> that's more inclusive and, and that's more fun. Uh, and there are certain uh, things such as uh, collaborative fact checking that maybe people feel it's not the best for the government to do. And then mm. you you see Gov Zero. Heard about this? Uh, yeah, Gov okay. Zero end of us that builds a uh, bot uh, like a WhatsApp bot. This one is on on the line uh, system where you can just uh, forward all the disinformation and rumor uh, to it, and it would just do a cross source fact checking and get back to you or your uh, family chattering about uh, you know the the real thing uh, about it. And so again, uh, Gov Zero is really just a meme, and there's no cofact that gov that tw because it's, it's not something that we see the government should be doing. Uh, and so what I'm trying to say is that it's not just about forking existing government mm. website. And if you change the, the, the uh, you take the as away from cofact.org and go cofact.org, you get into the Thai version. Because everything the, uh, the Gov0 movement does uh, is open source. We really increase the copyright. So you can see its adoption very easily and very quickly uh, by nearby and some not so nearby uh, jurisdictions. So that's the, the real reason why I just devoted my, my full time into civic hacking, because it's just so, so much more fun. Cool. So uh, your answer, um, so you advise, obviously, um, world, a lot of world leaders on democracy. Uh, in a time when the United States has embraced um, an isolationist nationalism, why do you choose to participate in these international conversations and help other countries in really meaningful ways like like you showed with Italy and uh, Thailand? Mm -hmm. right. uh, first of all, I think uh, Taiwan uh, is, as I mentioned, uh, the really, according to the Civicus Monitor, the, the only uh, fully open when it comes to civic space um, in Asia. Uh, and um, only one of the only two, uh, when you count Asia Pacific, that's next to New Zealand. So, um, and I encourage you to check out Civicus Monitor. So, um, there is a strategic uh, aspect to it. Because if we uh, don't collaborate uh, with the jurisdictions that are fully open, uh, the, the ones that are shown in, in green here, uh, then we risk uh, our nearby jurisdiction's way of more authoritarian, and as you can see, authoritarianism is kind of popular in Asia, wow. um, that, that we risk having these the, uh, becoming the norm. So for example, uh, when it comes to disinformation, which has a uh, legal definition in Taiwan, it's called um, intentional harmful untruth and harming the public, not the government's image, which is just good journalism, uh, intentional harmful untruths that harms the public. Um, all the jurisdiction around us uh, has this instinct of, okay, maybe we can just encroach on the freedom of speech a little bit. Maybe we have the minister's words to be somehow above the journalist's words a little bit, and maybe that's for the greater cause. But in Taiwan, because we still remember the martial law, uh, and we really don't want to go back here, uh, we must innovate on ways that does not put the minister's words higher than a journalist's words. But we cannot develop this alone. 
And so strategically, we must co-create with all the jurisdictions that are green here and say that we uh, work on the playbook together. So for example, um, this is a, a Taiwanese model called uh, humor over rumor, uh, where every, every time we detect a trending rumor uh, online that said disinformation, uh, then the responsible ministry just roll out a meme uh, through memetic engineering uh, within a couple hour at most, on average they're doing 16 minutes now, um, and that are, is just genuinely very funny. So without censoring anyone, we just um, kind of hack the SEO uh, and so whenever you see, for example, this is a real rumor that says perming your hair will be subject to one million anti dollar fine starting next week. And within an hour, our prime minister just wrote out this uh, picture saying it's not true. And a young version of himself saying, I may be bought now, but I will not punish people with hair. Mm -hmm. And a fine print that says what we've done is a labeling requirement that takes care of the hair products starting 2021. And the pre prime minister, as he looks now, says, However, if you keep perming your hair many times a week, it will not damage your pocket, but it will damage your hair. When Siri, <laughs> you can just look at me of how you may become. Um, and so this is pretty good humor because he makes uh, fun of himself, right? Not anybody else. Um, and uh, he's being sincere, right? But it, it, it's scientifically correct. So um, it, it really went viral. And uh, if you search for perming hair, fine, whatever, um, this shows up instead of any rumor. And once you laughed about it, there re really is a vaccination because people who laughed about it and share it will not share the original of this information because the original this information is riding on the uh, psychological pathway that turns this personal anger of helplessness uh, into outrage, which is a positive emotion for the individual, but very negative uh, for online discussion. Mm -hmm. But if you laugh about it uh, and you see this, the humor in it, then this psychological energy is already spent and people will not actually be motivated into sharing things in outrage. So this is just one of many examples, but what I'm trying to say is that by working with um, jurisdictions that uh, just prioritizes uh, freedom of speech, assembly, and the civic rights, we can co-create such solutions uh, jointly without relying on authoritarianism, which tend to be more isolationist. Great, thank you for that. You're a vocal proponent for autodidacticism. What are you, why are you an autodidact and why do you believe that it might be better than learning through a conventional education system? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, we kind of hacked the, the education system now because starting uh, a year ago, uh, Taiwan uh, adopted a new curriculum that just prioritizes uh, autonomous learning. It's just one of these core value. It's the most important value uh, next to interaction and uh, the common good. Uh, and so um, it's just like open source. You started in this niche uh, thing and now you're the norm. Uh, but uh, 20 years ago, uh, when I first um, engaged the research community, uh, I was doing a science fair actually um, in 1995. Uh, I was 14 years old at the time. And I discovered this great website, which is still around, uh, the preprint website archive.org from Cornell University. And I remember because my science fair project is about um, doing kind of inference uh, on logic uh, and learning natural languages and just automated reasoning stuff, machine learning stuff. Um, and so there really is no textbook around it in 1994 um, that can actually work on my personal computer. So I had to go to archive and just click uh, artificial intelligence, computer science, uh, and just start reading uh, the papers. Of course, I don't understand half of it, uh, but it's okay because um, all these kind people have left their email addresses. So I just start writing them in very poor English. Uh, and they, anyway, uh, just saw me as a fellow researcher. Nobody knows that you're just a 14 years old across the internet. Um, and so I printed out those email exchanges. I eventually won, won the first place on the science fair. Uh, and then told the principal Congrats. that you, you, you tell me that uh, winning this science fair uh, gets me a, a guaranteed place in a prestigious um, um, senior high school. Uh, and that I can study with the professor of my choice uh, if I study hard and things like that in 10 years time. Um, but I'm studying with that professor, like co-creating really right now uh, without having to go through uh, this institutional education. And, and I'm seeing that all my textbooks were out of date and people are just co-creating knowledge now on this new thing called the World Web. And uh, it's really to the credit of my principal after reading the email printout and thinking for a couple of minutes um, and say, okay, you don't have to go to school anymore. <laughs> 
tomorrow. Uh, and then uh, she just covered for, for me because at the time it was still compulsory education. So mm. she just, you know, faked the attendance records. I'm sure that it's uh, wow. at the time for, for persecution now. Wow. But in any case, so, so that's why I, I so much believe uh, I'm so optimistic when it comes to uh, private and social and public sector collaboration because there is a principal that is uh, seeing a bit of future, right? Just not very uh, widely distributed and willing to be this yep. just nectar that enable this kind of um, autodidactism. So I, maybe I'm, I'm lucky, <laughs> but I'm, I'm supported by the preprint um, community and by people who honestly just don't care about my age, but just about my contribution. Well, that's um, that's something that we, we try to live. The whole idea of not really caring about your age, but your kind of willingness to contribute, and um, you know, things like your time and imagination. And um, that's it's a good segue to my next question: of um, how have communities helped you develop as a civic superhero? Mm -hmm. Well. Uh... I don't, I don't know about uh, superheroes, but uh, just or ordinary civic heroes as well. So anyway, so um, I think there's there's quite a few things um, that I want to highlight here, but I'll just highlight two. First is uh, about intergenerational solidarity. This is really important because uh, in Taiwan, we have this idea of reverse mentorship. Um, so what you're seeing here is the world skills champions, people who participate, I think it was in Russia uh, last year. Uh, they won the, the third place uh, overall. And these are people who specialize in, for example, um, car painting or uh, cloud deployment or whatever other skillful things that they are doing. Um, and, and they're uh, just parading on the national day uh, next to the athletes. Uh, it used to be that Taiwan only invite uh, like Olympic champions and things like that on the National Day Parade. But it's thanks to a very young, like 27-year-old uh, reverse mentor of the Ministry of Labor uh, that uh, we now promote these people, uh, not only on the National Day Parade, but actually inviting them to uh, co-create with the K-12 schools so that uh, the people learn to rebuild their schools together um, when they were just you know 14 years old. Uh, and they can see that the uh, technological high schools are not something that you go because you cannot place a good mark on the academic high schools, but if you have something that you really want to learn to contribute to the community. And the uh, Minister of Labor, of course, is in her I don't know, 60s, uh, and the uh, reverse mentor um, is less than 30 year, years old, younger than 30 years old, uh, but they form a partnership uh, where the uh, young reverse mentor, the youth counselor, can just invite any minister <laughs> to any meetings uh, and just show them the, the direction, show them the way. Uh, but uh, the feasibility, of course, uh, is being ensured by this um, Minister of Labor. So I'm trying to say um, this is uh, a norm in Taiwan where the young people point the new direction and the old people uh, reminds them how to make them work uh, without offending too many existing stakeholders. Uh, and so the community needs to be intergenerational before it can actually achieve a cross-sectoral um, understanding. And, and I, of course, benefited from the preprint um, researchers who are all like 40 years uh, my senior. So that's the, that's the first thing is learning from the or your elders. Uh, the, the other uh, thing, uh, other than presidential hackathon, um, is this um, cross, um, what, what I call transcultural settings. Uh, I set up those office hour and town halls starting in indigenous places because back when I was 14 years old and I dropped out of uh, high, junior high with the full blessing of the principal. Um, uh, the first thing I, the first place I went to is the Atayal uh, indigenous um, nation. Uh, and I just learned from their ways of looking at nature, interacting with nature and, and things like that. We, they don't need uh, foreign concepts such as sustainability because they've been around uh, since the time of Moana, right? So that is the, that is the idea um, of uh, seeing your own cultural upbringing from the perspective of another culture, widely different culture, but sharing the same line, the same mountains. And that's how I learned, for example, about natural personhood, about how people treat the mountains as spirits. And nowadays we see this idea being adopted in, say, New Zealand, uh, which is kind of a, a, a 
uh, we share the lineage, right? They, we people sailed from Taiwan to New Zealand, uh, the Maori people, I mean, um, culturally. Uh, and so they also have this idea that rivers and mountains can get um, a seat of board uh, membership um, as a kind of legal personhood uh, that represents the uh, previously non-voting stakes of the nature. And nowadays it's gaining currency in this idea. And so if, if we keep constraining ourselves in a very linear economy um, culture. We'll see this as nonsense. But by <laughs> moving to various different indigenous cultures and foreign cultures um, in the very beginning, in the very early on, uh, I consider the community not restricted to something that is only of a common kind of uh, social production, uh, but rather around uh, a set of social values that I can then inspect my own upbringing with. So I think intergenerational and cross transcultural that are the two communities that I benefit the most from. Amazing. Um, related to um, intergenerational uh, movements, uh, you've helped lead slash advise both the Sunflower Movement in Taiwan and the Umbrella Movement in Hong Kong, which were both struggles for democracy um, in resistance to uh, China. Uh, what have what has that taught you about what communities of courageous high schoolers uh, and college students who are committed to democracy can pull off? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Sunflower Movement is a, a really good example because uh, it was mostly um, just university students who feel that the sudden enactment of the Cross-Strait Service and Trade Act, or CSSTA, is not so much a good idea. And so they said, okay, the MPs refused to deliberate it substantially. So we occupy where the MP works, because we um, voted for the MPs anyway, and start doing their job for them. And that's the legitimacy theory. Um, and so it's very kind of thinking outside of the box. No, nobody really thought about this legitimacy theory uh, before they really broke in in 2014. Mm. But once they did so, um, all the very uh, senior people in various NGOs, there's more than 20 NGOs, each deliberating on one specific aspect of the CSSTA, just surrounded the parliament, protecting the young people from the police and from the rioters. Um, and then we start live streaming everything and letting people see that people are there really doing very civil deliberation and uh, inching together uh, toward a consensus every day. And at the end, they have four demands, uh, no one less, um, that uh, basically calls for a revaluation of CSSDA uh, and gets accepted by the head of the parliament. So it's one of the rare occupants that ends in a uh, more trust instead of less trust. Um, and so, uh, but if it were not the original thinking of the young people who broke into it, none of the social support or solidarity would happen. Uh, and I really think that being not constrained by a legacy, uh, by this um, uh, time-honored way of doing things, uh, this kind of uh, unbounded thinking, uh, really helped them to find this new response to a new situation at hand. Amazing. Um, so, more Americans than ever are working from home. Mm -hmm. uh, with all the experience you have connecting and collaborating with people remotely, what advice do you have for people who are just trying to get used to it? Oh, okay. Yeah, I've been working um, in telecommunication and through telecommunication for, for 20 years now. Uh, and there's uh, only really two main challenges. One is social isolation. Uh, it's kind of a, a sense of loneliness. Uh, and the other one is what we call perma work, which you never stop working. Um, and so, uh, <laughs> and, and these two have very simple solutions um, to address um, social isolation. Um, you can work in a co-working space. You can work uh, with uh, kind of social rituals. Um, back when I work uh, remotely uh, with Silicon Valley companies, there's people, um, there's a colleague who just ordered some Napa Valley uh, red wines. Uh, it's not like super expensive wines, but he took the um, trouble to just ship them to Taiwan. Oh, wow. And we have this ritual of uh, so nice, just nice. every um, couple uh, weeks and just opening the same, same bottle of wine and, and mm. just um, sharing a moment together so that we have something other than, you know, bits of um, 
pixels uh, yep. to talk about. So yep. that's that's for social um, cohesion uh, across uh, across space. Um, and the perma work uh, again is a very um, kind of insidious uh, thing. Uh, and the simple solution really um, is just to make a space for web and make a space for. Um, are personal. Uh, sometimes if you have live in, in a smaller space, people sometimes say, okay, if I'm using the iPad, it's for personal, but if I'm using the MacBook, um, it's for work. And so it, there's got to be a, a, a ritual uh, when you just commute to work. And, and uh, yeah. even so um, as simple as just passing through a different uh, corridor and things like that, mm -hmm. reminding yourself you're going to work and back can really help. Um, and once you are in work, I use personally the Pomodoro uh, method, uh, where I focus for 25 minutes and take a five-minute break. Um, and that, again, reminds us that it's not just about work. Um, it's also about uh, taking a moment to, to reflect, to be with your body and things like that, at least for five minutes every half an Thank you. Uh, so you, you talk about how it's hard to run against open government, transparency, and participation. Uh, and if that's the case, why is American democracy so much further behind Taiwan's? And uh, what can we do about that? Well, I think it's simply because you have a longer history right? So uh, of democracy, I mean. So um, there's a lot of um, artifacts uh, in any democratic systems that used to run on paper. Uh, which is a very analog uh, technology. Uh, and any technology that has uh, what we call a, a migration path um, from the previous migration eras. Path, yep. Yeah, previous eras of, for example, broadcast radios and television, uh, which is all about having millions of people listening to one person, likely the president, uh, rather than one person listening to millions of people or have million people um, listening to one another. Uh, and that creates an inertia uh, that it's really hard to fight against. Uh, the most um, that we can do uh, is just to build uh, viable, compelling alternatives at the city level, the township level, and county level, and so on, and show people that really it is possible and actually much more fun um, to listen at scale instead of uh, uploading five bits of information every couple of years, which is called voting. Um, and just as Buckminster Fuller said, uh, it's not about fighting the old system, it's about building new systems so that the old ones are rendered obsolete. Uh, and this is easier in Taiwan because when we got presidential election, that's 1996, we already have the wild web. So there really is no, no legacy to overcome, no uh, inertia of the systems. But uh, all our innovations are, of course, readily deployable um, to polities of similar scale. So not necessarily starting from the federal level in, in the case of the US. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Josh uh, in New York. What is the biggest mistake you have made and what did you learn from it? Well, um, today I made a mistake of not fully charging the MacBook that I'm connecting with. Um, <laughs> so I have to switch a laptop uh, and I will be back in 30 seconds or so. That's hilarious. Uh, so everyone, the, the Dory link that I put there, if you want to upvote, because we're not going to be able to get over every question. Even if you don't have a question, you can upvote other people's questions so that they go to the top. And Gary, I'm going to break uh, protocol. As a former government official, we need to make sure they answer that question. So. Oh, yeah, 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 for <laughs> sure. For sure. All right, now we're back. Um, can you still hear me? Yeah. Okay, that's great. All right, so, so more, more seriously, um, aside from um, forgetting to go. charge my phone. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think it's it's um, early on uh, when I first became the digital minister, I was already a, a reverse mentor, a understudy uh, for the previous um, minister in charge of cyberspace uh, regulatory adjustments. Um, and at that time, uh, all most of my work uh, is about working with the administration uh, of the Korea Public Civil Service. Uh, and I remember training thousands of career public service and art of this. Um, but that was 
kind of a mistake that I should have been working uh, also with the members of the parliament because the early direct democracy did early occupy, although it gained a lot of uh, popular support, um, many of the MPs uh, saw it as a kind of threat at the work that they're doing. And this is unnecessarily um, so, because what we've do, been doing uh, through crowdsourcing and listening and skill is in design thinking terms, more about extending the uh, discover and the define um, at the first diamond uh, when it comes to public issues so that we can find the how might we question, the key questions for uh, what the um, UK people call wicked problems and where as the representatives in charge of the budget and legislation is more about delivering and um, the implementation of these ideas. So about develop and deliver. Um, but uh, instead of showing this very clear picture <laughs> in the very beginning, um, with was help from uh, people from IDEO and CID, uh, the professional designers, we kind of um, um, duplicated work uh, and just did some um, parliamentary work because maybe because we occupied the parliament. Uh, and so that was a mistake. And it uh, took a couple of years uh, for the MPs to realize that e-petition and things like that actually augments their work instead of replacing their work. So now with this fresh batch of MPs, some very young cosplayers, um, like 20-ish uh, mm. So um, we're, we're now at a point where we can work very fruitfully uh, with the parliament, but we took four years to do so. And if we uh, learn about this earlier, uh, we could have saved like two or four years. Great question from Rocco. How has Taiwan's democratic values helped in its response to the COVID-19 pandemic, especially in a digital sense? And I know this, I know you've done a lot. So this is a great question. Right. Uh, well, there's a, uh, I think, a uh, recent article um, that, that talk about this, actually many recent articles, but there is one article that talk about specifically how civic technology can help stop a pandemic. Um, I think that's just the title. If you Google for it, uh, you can see, I think it's in foreign affairs or, or foreign policy. I have trouble telling them uh, apart. But anyway, so um, the, the simple answer is that the civic technologists are empowered with open data and we trust citizens with open data. So everybody can very easily see, for example, how many surgical masks are around their vicinity um, in any of the pharmacies and it's updated like every three minutes or something. And so, yeah, that's, that's the article. So uh, the idea of the government publishing the real-time stock level of surgical mask of all the pharmacies uh, leaves a lot of room. For example, people build voice assistants, uh, Siri extensions, uh, navigation uh, maps, uh, this trend uh, analysis, uh, and all things like that. Um, there's more than 100 um, applications, and it's all done uh, within the scope of a time scope of three days. Wow. Uh, and so just by publishing the open data, committing wow. to uh, listen to the feedback from the civic technologists and updating the real-time data. For example, the pharmacies say, uh, we also want to, uh, to, to issue our own PSAs to the people in the vicinity, and we updated the open data field for that and so on. So it became a real data collaborative where nobody owns, but everybody have a joint controllership um, into the ecosystem. And that's just for uh, mask distribution. Uh, there's many other uh, zip tech projects, and I encourage you to read the article. Great. Will do. What kind of inequities do you think pervade a digital democracy? Uh, does lack of access to technology and tech literacy significantly impact a digital democracy, or will most groups still be equally represented? Well, certainly. And, and that is why in Taiwan, broadband is a human right. The, the internet penetration rate is, I think, um, almost 90% now. Uh, and even in the top uh, of Taiwan, literally the highest point, like 4,000 meters almost, 
in the Yushan or in the indigenous language, Sabia. Uh, this is um, like you still have 10 megabits per second uh, at only 15 US dollars per month for unlimited 4G connection. Oh. And if you don't, it's my fault. So we, we believe very strongly in providing broadband as a human right and through digital opportunity centers, devices and uh, how to uh, lessons and so on. So we're, I'm actually very proud that in our e-participation platform, uh, join.gov, the most actively contributing age groups are around 15 years old and they are around 65 years old. Wow. There, there's no, no age gap. And these two groups of people have, I guess, more time on their hands, but also care more about sustainability, about public values instead of just private um, benefits. And uh, it's really heartwarming to see them partner so well on important uh, e-petitions. For example, on banning the use of uh, takeout plastic straws for the national identity drink bubble tea um, and things like that, which are all proposed by people who are 15 years old who don't even have voting rights and supported by people who are 65. All right, we'll do uh, two more questions. Um, we have a, an anonymous one. I admire how the Taiwanese government makes so many records transparent, including chat conversations, budget information. Do you find that everyday people have enough time and desire to review that information? Well, not the raw data, certainly. Uh, just as we really don't have time, I don't have time to review all the real-time stock level of surgical masks in all the 6,000 pharmacies. And there's no need to, right? People only want to know which pharmacy near them have surgical masks available. And that is a simple query to a vast data sets. Um, and the same uh, for all the, pretty much all the open data. So, so the point is not about people reviewing all the information. It's about enabling journalists and by journalists, I mean people who add their own perspectives, their own interpretations, um, investigative journalists to empower them to have uh, the same time to market uh, as opposed to people who are just there for the scoop. Um, so if you don't have a transparency in communication, uh, investigative journalists are at a disadvantage because they have to spend a lot of calories just to get the, the sources, but they don't have much time to add in their perspectives. And once they do, it's probably already swamped uh, by other social media stuff. But by, for example, in Taiwan, the uh, Central uh, Epidemic uh, Command Center uh, do a live um, interview with all the press uh, conference. It's all live streamed. People can just type in in this YouTube chat room uh, and all the journalists uh, can ask all the questions they want. There is no time limit. Um, the CECC just responds to everything, sometimes twice a day. Uh, and in this um, way, um, all the investigative journalists are empowered to make really good um, 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 tools for people to, to at a glance see what it's about. Um, there's one in uh, the news lens. If you search for, I don't know, international news lens Taiwan COVID, you see this rotating globe of uh, really good, um, in, in English too, uh, journalistic output of what the CECC has been doing, catering to the expat um, audience and so on. So every investigative journalist then cater to their um, story readers uh, and do the interpretative work, but they always can uh, include the source so that people can independently check the source for themselves. Mm -hmm. So this is about a kind of ladder of expertise uh, that the more raw data and uh, information that you have on the upper tier, it more empowers the um, people, the storytellers uh, mm -hmm. in the different parts of the ladder. But if you don't, if you only have um, hearsay or uh, random um, social media uh, announcements, then it's kind of like a zigzag uh, where yeah. people really don't know what's going on. Right. All right, so I want to end uh, with a final question. Uh, in this, this pretty crazy time, what gives you hope? Hmm. Well, I, I think the, the um, coronavirus thing, um, more so than climate change, uh, really brings uh, us together um, across time and space. Um, in climate change, which is already a, a global problem, um, its emergency status is felt differently. Right? If you uh, are in a jurisdiction that has a very large landmass and you are not living close to the coastal areas or the places with wildfire, you, you simply don't feel it that much. And that, that, that's a fact. 
and Taiwan have many uh, friendly Pacific Islander um, friends and like Tuvalu uh, who feel this like very strongly because their uh, area is really small and they feel climate change literally every day. Um, and Taiwan is somewhat in between because we're after a larger island. Um, so the, the point here is that climate change, while being truly global, is fueled on a different time scale depending on where you are on Earth. But coronavirus is felt in the same time as one. It's literally within not even a year, and people are tackling um, very similar problems uh, across the world. So I think uh, we can learn also something uh, from the virus uh, by saying that uh, just being open in our innovations, um, just making sure that ideas spread fast and wide, uh, that it, we let it mutate, meaning that we don't hold it back through copyright and patents, um, then the most uh, active, appropriate strains uh, will be appropriated uh, by the local people uh, across the world uh, to become appropriate technology so that technology really answer to the social problems instead of causing more social problems by asking the society to conform to technology. So bring tech to people instead of asking people uh, to, to conform to tech, I think uh, is more so important in the coronavirus uh, situation than in others. And we won't forget about how to collaborate across Zoom um, <laughs> even after the coronavirus is over. So I think it really is quite enlightening. Yep. It may be a blessing in disguise. Well said. Well, um, it, was a, it was a tremendous gift uh, for you to be here today. Um, and for you to be this up this early and you were more than coherent, you were so inspiring. Um, and I, I, I couldn't think of a better time for you to join us today. Um, so mm -hmm. thank you so much for uh, your time. And I think, yeah, thank, 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 thanks questions. everyone else. Yep, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, so, uh, if you have to go, um, you know, please go, uh, I'm going to hang out here mm -hmm. for a little bit, uh, for okay. anyone that wants to, to chat, but, um, thanks so much, Audrey. Thank you, and stay safe and warm. Bye. Bye.